Hey, and welcome to the Cube Pod, episode 51. I'm John Furrier, Dave Vellante. We're here in the Palo Alto studio for this podcast. Dave, uh, kicking off 51. What a week. It's been a couple whirlwind, three weeks. We've been in studio for SuperCloud 6. Yep. We had um, the big week in GTC. Our Cube team is up in Paris, France for KubeCon, CNCF's Cloud Native Con. Um, just uh, an amazing time right now in the industry. Um, and NVIDIA's conference really kind of set the tone and raised the bar in terms of like, where these AI systems are going and just the financial performance of NVIDIA stock price and just the financial performance on the business fundamentals has everybody in the industry um, on notice. Like, wow, it's mind blowing performance. Um, it's technology um, uh, shift um, that's categorically new. And, and the CEO Jensen Wong saying, this is a new category of how things are going to get done. Uh, and it represents a cultural inflection point. And I think this week, um, with all the content going around around the world with KubeCon and then NVIDIA GTC. And of course, we were at the Broadcom financial uh, investor analyst meeting uh, yesterday morning for a few bunch of hours, getting the scoop on their entire process for custom silicon and new, new packaging techniques based on open foundational standards. You're seeing the rise of a generational shift in the computer industry. And the impact is something like from a, experience standpoint, I've never seen before. I've seen great shifts in my time and you know, coming out of high school and going into college, you saw that move from mainframes to PCs and mini computers and the rise of local area networks, internetworking, the internet, mobile computing, social media. But now we're at an era that is just so different and it's, it's pumping on all cylinders. I mean, every theater uh, is, is, is on fire in a good way. You got an industry revolution industrial revolution, we call it a, you know, the, the, uh, the tech revolution again, the systems revolution. You've got the computing paradigm has changed radically. Applications are going to change radically. And then ultimately you have a physical world of robotics connecting in with uh, digital. So you have the perfect storm of innovation happening. And I think NVIDIA's event is a flashpoint because it, it gets everyone's attention. This greed, this power, this technology, <laughs> it's social impact. I mean, the money being made around this new era will be fan, fantastic, a great opportunity. And a conference like NVIDIA is about chips. It's a developer conference that is for the alpha nerds, yet hedge funds are there, venture capitalists were there. Uh, um, you had VCs hanging around the bar in the lobbies. Where's the action? I mean, people can smell the money, they can smell the opportunity, they see the value. Also, some people are, are scared too. So I think this week represents what we've been talking on theCUBE for some time as uh, that inflection point and it's real and it's, it's, and you can see the quantification of where, where it's going to go. You start to see visibility into the money, the applications, the systems, the systems revolution, specifically the tech innovation, and the societal impact. And of course, new things like robotics. So robots, we're going to be in robot error. I mean, it's incredible. Yeah, so <clears throat> to me, John, this was the, the single most important event in the history of the computer industry. Uh, and I don't, I mean, in terms of oh, like a, a show. Statement. And uh, I've really been thinking about this and I was trying to say, okay, what else could match this? So I, I go back to the early Comdex days when Bill Gates was presenting on the future of the PC. This was bigger. I think about the early reInvent, maybe even the first reInvent. You know, the first or second reInvent when Andy Jassy basically, really the first one, he stood up. And, and so. When I say that, I don't mean in terms of size. There was whatever, 20, 25, 30,000 people there. There are many bigger events. But in terms of the industry impact, I think this was the biggest event in the history of the computer industry. And the reason I say that is to your point, it was a developer conference, but everybody was there. All the partners, we're going to talk about, you know, there's just so many you know, press releases that were done. Every company did a press release. <laughs> you know, super gluing themselves to NVIDIA. But also, there were industries there. I put out a tweet of one of the, the slides that Jensen showed in his keynote, and these were speakers. So JP Morgan Chase, MITRE, Honeywell, Foxconn, Deloitte, Disney Research, eBay. I mean, these are, these are, these are presenters at the conference across industry. So we've talked for years about how every company's a technology company and every company's a software company. Well, <laughs> every company's now an AI company, right? We're all experts at AI, but so the reach was really tremendous. 
everybody's talking about it. All the news shows and the business news channels talked about it, not just as a one hit. Hey, we, we stopped by CES and we got, did a couple interviews. This was like a week long and people are still talking about it. And then the other thing is, the really positive thing in my mind is despite the tough macro, the market's broadening. It's not just the Magnificent, Magnificent Seven, it's not just NVIDIA. Uh, Jensen talked about Ansys, Synopsys, Cadence, Dell got a big lift. I mean, of course, you know, HPE was there and Lenovo was there and Supermicro and on and on and on. Snowflake and Databricks did a deal with them. And just everybody is, you always said, rising tide, lifting all ships. It, it is happening, finally broadening in the stock market, which I think is a good thing. And the other thing is Micron announced last night. And they announced that their high bandwidth memories, John, are, are back ordered till like 2025. And we heard yesterday at the Broadcom financial meeting, and I know we're going to talk about that a lot, yeah. how Broadcom is developing you know, the communications technology to, to talk to all the XPUs and all the memory. And so they got a big lift for other reasons as well. We'll talk about it. They got a third big custom customer. But this, again, I, I think it is the single biggest event in the history of the computer industry. Well, I think the, the, the Micron is actually a good announcement. It's going to be an allocation of supply. Uh, the demand uh, is so high for content, I mean, uh, for components, um, and also the supply chain is challenging. We're going to see if that's going to cause a change in pricing uh, of some of these companies. So that's going to be something to watch. But back to your NVIDIA thing, we're going to, and we do want to touch on Broadcom because we did have a lot of time with the execs there and we got the, the full picture. And it's important to explain the, the, the custom silicon trend that now they have only three customers, but you're going to, I predict you'll see chips for the masses come out of this process, the way they've managed to open technologies. But if you look at NVIDIA, the thing that jumped out at me besides what I said earlier and what you just said is, is that every single company that we've been following pretty much has a deal with NVIDIA. Everyone's a partner, yeah. hard, you know, flexing on Twitter and LinkedIn, our strategic partnership with NVIDIA. And yeah. everyone's got the strategic partnership with NVIDIA. Like what the hell do they have? So when you peel back the onion, there are really not a lot of partnerships. It's pretty much Barney deals, reference implementations and or um, you know, we love each other and, and more intent commitments. Um, we're intending to do something. So I didn't really see a lot of um, NVIDIA good deals that I could point at and say, wow, that is a real partnership. Um, the Dell AI factory was kind of, you know, it's a, it's a buzzwordy name, but, you know, building end to end. <laughs> Jensen said, Dell, nobody is better at building end-to-end -end systems than Dell. I mean, he stood up on stage and said that. I was like shocked that he said yeah, that. Yeah, I wonder what the, what the true partnership is. I mean, it almost feels like everyone kind of is revealing that they're in and they're ready, to, they're working on it. It's not like it's out yet. Like there's a lot That's of true. behind the curtain activity. Uh, even with Dell, and we follow Dell pretty closely, I do think they have a good relationship. I think Jensen's telegraphing a little bit to Dell. Um, the way he called Michael Dell out in the keynote, um, Michael had all his lieutenants there, Sam, Ehab, and others. Uh, their booth was on fire. I thought they had great booth presence there. Right, I mean, I, mean, right, I, thought, I thought Dell Technologies stole the show from all the vendors. Um, they're writing big checks. And, and, and so to NVIDIA, well, they, 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 had, they had good activations. I mean, they, but, had, they were showing rag in action. Uh, and you can see where they're going, right? Your point about their booth was, their booth was packed. I mean, I mean a lot of booths were packed too, but, but Dell is, getting inundated with inbounds now. I mean, you know, I mean, Dell you know, generally still is a low margin hardware company, but they're, still, <laughs> they're so relevant now, like yeah. overnight with this AI wave and they're, you know, we saw them at Mobile World Congress yeah. and so they're doing some things, you know, H and then HPE with the supercomputing, mm -hmm. you know, uh, uh, acquisitions that they've made, all of a sudden they're like relevant you know, overnight. Yeah. And if you look at the yeah. show floor, you look at the show floor, I think there could be a lot more booths there. HPE was there and a bunch of other ones and new names were out there. Obviously Super Micro is rising to the top. I mean, then the brand of Super Micro and Micro has become um, significant in its, in its brand value. I mean, it was a great brand as a quote supplier of servers and anyone who's done anything over the past decade has probably bought yeah, Super key ODMs for sure, right? Some boxes, assembled their own data center. But I think now we're living in, a day, in an era where with, with this big AI shift, every time you've seen movements like this, and again, like I said, I think this is bigger than anything I've ever seen it's by, a, by a multiple factor, 10 to 100x more than the PC revolution and other waves. 
anytime you have a shifting of the winds like this, okay, think of it whether it's a big wave or a, the changing of the wind, um, there's opportunity. And so companies like Dell um, and others will capture that. And there will be winners, big winners. There'll be either existing incumbents that will take advantage of the wind shift or the tide turning, the whatever you want to call the metaphor is that that's going to happen. And then you're going to have people who won't. And we're going to see a lot of losers that are going to come out of this. So, you know, if you look at the market, it's going to be very clear winners and losers in the arena here. So like I'm telling you right now, you're just going to start to see the tell sign of what a winner looks like and what a loser looks like. And, and if you're a loser, um, you, you, you better, better start thinking quickly. I better get on this new AI infrastructure because the infrastructure is changing fast. And what came out of the NVIDIA show, one of the things that, that wasn't really talked about on some of the mainstream outlets like CNBC and others who were there kind of going gaga over NVIDIA, the real story that's coming out of NVIDIA is a brand new infrastructure is being reset. Okay, and that means the infrastructure to power AI will be a lot different than the infrastructure to power the last generations of the computer industry. That means pretty much everything will be old fast. And so if you have old stuff and you don't make it new and cool like the new stuff, you will be on the losing side. And you know, like I was saying yesterday on theCUBE, if you're not software defined, you're in trouble. If you're embedding compute in your say flash arrays or your servers and you're not decoupling that, you're in trouble. So physical and software defined will be a big part of it. And I think that's what I also learned at Broadcom, that foundational technologies based on open technologies will be the winning hand. And we're going to see how people configure their infrastructure. So I want to, I want to just think about something you said about you know, a lot of Barney deals. And it's true, there were a lot of Barney deals because people want to get attention. But I think, John, there's also a lot of creativity going on where people are saying, okay, I can get my hands on these GPUs and I can do things with them that NVIDIA is not going to do, although I'll come back to that, but that give us a unique value in the marketplace for customers. And I'll, I'll give you an example. The, one of the more interesting conversations we had, I thought, was at that vast luncheon with Genesis, which is, you know, you see all these um, alternative clouds, these GPU clouds coming out, AI clouds, like CoreWeave, Genesis, and there are many others. Vast has, has sort of running the table on those guys because they're doing petabyte scale, you know, object storage, and they've got their 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 file system. But these companies are competing with the cloud players, who of course have so much money. But their 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 premise is we're going to be more agile. We're built for the AI era. We're not like traditional general purpose workloads with with multi tenant. We are building infrastructure that's specifically for AI. Now, we asked the Genesis guy, how, you know, how are you competing from a CapEx standpoint? They're obviously well capitalized, they, but these companies have a you know, bunch of dough behind them, but they are able to compete, it seems anyway, with the hyperscalers. And I don't know what kind of lead they have, whether or not the hyperscalers will close that gap, but John, it's a classic innovator's dilemma. Well, I think the PC is changing. I think Dell's opportunity. I think NVIDIA has been bundling in Tensor Core and all the millions of PCs. Um, they've been running CUDA in a way with the, with the graphics processor. So I think the AI PC is going to be a real deal. I think that's going to have legs. I think um, it, it, it'll look a lot different. We'll see how they, they, they bundle in, say, LLMs and, and language models into these PCs. But they'll have the hardware. They'll have some NVIDIA in there. Uh, and I just think that you know this idea of the AI factory that uh, and Jensen and NVIDIA talk about, again, point to the fact that the infrastructure outside of the big cloud guys are going to be reset. So the classic modern enterprise is going to look at new architectures and it will include AWS and Azure and Google Cloud and Oracle Cloud, as well as on-premise activity So and edge. So I think you're going to see a distributed computing paradigm continue to emerge um, and mobile devices will just be an IoT kind of edge and uh, you'll see small language models on devices. Oh, like Qualcomm at MWC, we had Qualcomm on and they were talking about how last year at MWC they had a billion parameter model running on a yeah. phone and then a smartphone and this year they had seven billion and I think they're going to be, you know, tripling that in the, in yeah. the future. So that's pretty amazing. You know, the other thing, David Floria came to me in 2021 and said, Dave, we got to do something on NVIDIA. This company is going to dominate the data center. So we wrote a breaking analysis how NVIDIA is going to you know, dominate the data center and run the table on AI. And what 
but what struck me is at the time, it, you know, he obviously knew and understood well, as we've been reporting on you know, CUDA and the impact of CUDA and, that, and what an enabler it was. He said at the time that NVIDIA could give away the hardware, which they're not doing, and then they could just sell the software and license that and they could have a great business. Now, of course, they're not giving away the hardware. You know, supposedly Blackwell, which is the new chip that they announced, is going to be you know, $50,000 <laughs> a pop, <laughs> um, which is going to double the previous generation, but we'll see what the actual pricing is. Um, but, the, but, but NVIDIA did announce an enterprise license for $4,500 a year per GPU for you know, building digital twins, and you know, they demonstrated really some powerful you know, software. So that's a whole nother vector of growth for them. And when we were in the analyst uh, uh, round table with in, NVIDIA with, with Jensen, somebody asked like, how big can that market be? He said, well, let's assume we had a million GPUs out there and it's 4,500 bucks a piece. <laughs> you know, that's a four or $5 billion you know, revenue stream annually that can grow. And so that you're starting to see these business models. There are concerns, I will tell you, in private conversations I had is, you know, Jensen said we start with this you know, concept of a, you know, a system and a data center. You, you're, you've been talking about clustered systems, and then we break it up and sell it in parts. Well, you know, he's showing racks. I mean, he's showing supercomputers. Yeah, basically data saying we'll sell this to you. So a lot of the people who sell that equipment are looking at that, going, "Huh, well, well, buy it from us." <laughs> <laughs> so, so he's got he's got his own you know, he's got his clouds going right. You can mm -hmm. get the DGX cloud. He's selling systems. He's selling parts. You know, he's selling to everybody. And so I think that has some people a little bit concerned. Um, now. They don't have the service infrastructure that, like a Dell or an HPE or you know Lenovo have, um, but that's yeah. something that people are talking about, and I think has people concerned. Yeah, and I think one of the things people are also talking about is that the the, the flip around how chips are being built. Old school conventional wisdom was make the chips smaller, faster, pack them all on a motherboard. Now the the model, as Jensen pointed out with Blackwell, was we want to make the largest chip possible because the benefits of having a chip gives you power and all that inter high speed interconnect built into the chip works better. And uh, you mentioned NV Link, uh, NV uh, Link and NV, NV Switch, NV Link Switch. These things can't go down. He also said um, the AI chips need to be bigger and you got the low energy series to bridge them together. That's the logical layer to make it simple. Chips talk to each other. You can start chips talking to each other on these transformer engines. But the bottom line is that he basically said we basically build, we build the data center uh, and, and we just sell them in parts. So they're essentially building the data center of the future, um, which could be renamed as cloud or a set of machines. I mean, Amazon and, you know, as Larry Ellison once said on the Churchill Club, the big, remember that big video years and years ago, the cloud, what's the cloud? It's just a bunch of servers, right? So, um, <laughs> and he's kind of right, because Amazon is a collection of servers. James Hamilton and the team there innovated around how to host and, and Amazon is, the, is, to me, the poster child of innovation around how to build large-scale data centers, as is Google and Facebook uh, as, as well, as, as they've started realizing the large systems. Um, so Jensen's essentially building a data center for NVIDIA with all their stuff. Yeah. And he's basically renting out parts. You want some GPUs? And they charge per GPU. And you know, the controversial statement, I will say, is, is that they're not in the software business, Dave. They're in the GPU business, chip business, and they happen to sell a license for CUDA on a per GPU basis. And he said, it's very simple. We sell $4,500 per GPU. They put a million GPUs out there, do the math, right? Uh, and that's their, that's their business model. But it's, it's pegged to the C GPU, I mean, not, they, not a software renewal license. You're right. You know, so it's like they're there in the chip business. They're in the hardware they are, business. They're, they are a hardware company. I mean, there's no question. I mean, of course, about software. Their software's key, but like the chips themselves. But, but it is that is the enabler, the ability to program these GPUs. That was the enabler. I mean, you look, listen to Ilya talk about that when they got their hands on CUDA. They were like, okay, now we can really actually do things yeah. with this system. Um, and you mentioned series. To me, the two most interesting, you know, we talk in these waves, <clears throat> oftentimes it's the picks and shovels. People talk about picks and shovels, meaning the infrastructure companies that are going to do really well, the, using the analogy of that's who made all the money in the gold rush, the guys who sold the picks and shovels, not necessarily the, the miners. But at any rate, to me, the two most interesting AI companies right now, and both sort of 
by accident, by design, are NVIDIA and Broadcom. And they have two dramatically different philosophies and strategies. Obviously, um, NVIDIA is making giant chips, giant GPUs, and building huge systems. <clears throat> Broadcom doesn't make GPUs, right? <laughs> Broadcom makes all the technology that connects all the GPUs and the CPUs and the neural processing units and the LPUs, whatever XPU you want to use, and all the memories, all the high bandwidth memories, they connect all that stuff together. Why is that important? Because you have this <clears throat> processor renaissance going on. In the old world of x86, x86 managed everything. You know, all, all the memory management, I mean, everything, all the peripherals around it was, x86 was the center of the universe. And what's happening now is all these XPUs, they want to do stuff. <laughs> and so they need access to memory. They need access to resource. So Broadcom makes the technology to enable that. And, and you, you can't do AI without that. So they're just sitting in a, an unbelievable position. As well, NVIDIA not only makes the GPUs, they make all the you know, interconnectivity, both within the system and across you know, switching. And the acquisition of Mellanox enabled them to do InfiniBand. And then there's this sort of urinary Olympics going on between InfiniBand and, and, and Ethernet, right? Jensen essentially said Ethernet's useless for AI. Yesterday we heard from Broadcom is that that's bullshit. Yeah. I mean, everybody's doing Ethernet. All these hyperscale companies are doing Ethernet and they're doing AI. So that's nonsense. And then the ultra Ethernet is what allows them to scale. And so, you know, there's that interesting debate. And then, of course, Broadcom says, by the way, NVIDIA is our fastest growing customer. And so... <laughs> In one of their divisions, who knows? So, it, yeah, well, so... And then, of course, they announced... I'm switching to Broadcom here, but they yeah. announced that the, the third big custom silicon customer, we know that Google's been a customer for 10 years. We know f uh, Meta has been probably the last four or five years yeah. been, a, been a custom silicon customer, and um, Hawk Tan sits on the board of Meta. And this, we suspect that it's ByteDance is the third. You suspect. I do suspect that. Yeah. You don't, you don't agree? Well, I think Facebook must be in the mix because obviously oh, definitely Hawk, Meta. Hawk Tan is on the board of Meta. Yeah, that's the second one. There's, there's three, they announced a third. There's, we know it's Google. We, How do you know we, it's we Google? Know it's, we know. Trust me, I know. Okay. <laughs> it's, 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 and it's always been, been they, they've been the biggest, cost. they were their first, Broadcom's first custom silicon customer, and Meadow was the second. And I really do think the third was ByteDance. There was an analyst. It might be Amazon. Well, let's talk about it. So there was the, it, the, what, the reason why I really think it's ByteDance is because there was a question that was asked are there restrictions in terms of you selling to China? So that was an attempt. And I remember Pierre, who was a really sharp analyst in front of us, said, nice try. And I was like, yeah, nice try, but I'm really interested he's in asking, what the answer he's is. Asking, he's asking a different he's, question. He's basically, saying, he's, is, them. he's basically saying, is the custom silicon customer bite dance? And are you restricted from selling to them yeah. because, of, because of the China restrictions? And Charlie Cowa said, at this time, there are no restrictions yeah, so, for us selling. Yeah, the, the, question, the question was technology. clearly trying to see if that, that option was yeah, yeah. to eliminate ByteDance. So it did not it, eliminate ByteDance. It Byte did Dance. not eliminate so, ByteDance. So by process of elimination, you have to keep ByteDance in the mix. <laughs> now, the other, the, the, if we unpack this and, yeah. and decode what Charlie Cowis was saying, he was very clear that the consumer AI, the ROI in the business case is so clear. Bigger clusters I mean you can do better AI. You can get more people to click on your stuff and stay on your 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 platform longer, and so it's a no-brainer. He's saying to for these these consumer internet companies, i.e., Google Search and Meta and all the social media companies, to build bigger clusters. Very clear business case. The business case in the enterprise, not as clear. So that's why I feel like. It, it, it's got to be bite dance because they they can make more money. Now let's talk about Broadcom. So we were at the Broadcom Financial Analyst Investor Day, where they bring in all the top investors, which is essentially all the hedge funds and buy side, sell side analysts to come in. The sharp people had a few industry analysts. We were there, um, and some other uh, only two other industry analysts were there. So it was like four four industry analysts. So we're right. technically kind of in between. We're like above industry analysts, below financial analysts, because the cube gives us a little bit more um, uh, view there than the industry analyst. Right. Um, so we're kind of in the middle between the new, the, those two categories. 
Uh, but it's good to get access. So we saw Charlie Kawaz, Jez Tremblay, and all the execs by the divisions. And they laid it out. They basically presented, this is Broadcom Semiconductor uh, strategy and set of key products and technologies that we think will dominate our business for the next decade, okay? Um, we kind of had a lot of visibility on what they were doing, but we didn't have a lot of the details. So for me, I learned a lot and connected many dots. So my notebook was full. Um, clearly, um, it was great to level up, but it's very clear to me that Broadcom is essentially laying out, look at we're open book. Um, yeah, and they were polite about the NVIDIA comment. I thought that was clever. You know, hey, you know, of course they're a customer. They're, everyone's a customer. Yeah. But Broadcom, I think, is doing something so interesting around custom silicon, and that was really I wanted to focus on. The, the interconnect answer to NV link, okay, uh, and PCIE, role of Ethernet, what will be the interconnects? And what they presented, what Charlie Kawaz and the team presented was the clusters of, of the future, the AI clusters that are needed to run AI at scale. They laid out the architecture. It was a magical picture, I loved it. And then they also talked about what the AI chip needs to look like. And so what they meant by that is that this is the kind of chip that's needed for AI-like workloads in the, these clusters, and these, this is how the clusters have to behave. I thought that was really right on point. And the second thing was is that they show the role of ethernet and the role it plays with power and cooling in these new clusters at scale. So they really kind of laid it all out. And then finally, they really kind of showcased, I think their competitive advantage, which is their custom silicon process, which will allow them to manufacture custom silicon at a pace uh, of less than 12 months ramped up into production. So what that means is, um, notwithstanding supply chain constraints like HBM, uh, high bandwidth memory and other components, they literally could be creating custom silicon for the masses. And that's a game changer. That's just never been done before. So you have this open foundational technologies that they built on, Ethernet, PCIe and others. They essentially have prefabricated an, op an automation factory for all the design side. So all you got to do is swap out your processor. So as processors change, they're going to build the apparatus around that system for these specialized chips that work in mega clusters, which we've been calling clustered systems. That's the PC of the future. That's the server of the future. So we're used to PCs and servers. You rack the server, you use PCs to work on. The chip of the future will work in a new kind of combination. I think Broadcom is, I think, really forward thinking on this. And I was blown away. And finally, their final competitive advantage will be their packaging. Their unique ability to do packaging of the processors and the chips is really going to be a major differentiator. So if you're in competition with Broadcom, you know, good luck. Um, and they were kind of, they weren't totally grandstanding too much, but they were proud. You can see that they're like, wow. they're like, look at this is like what we got. Good luck with the competition. It was really I mean, NVIDIA was more like bragging about their competitive position, but Broadcom was kind of humble, but they're like, good luck with the competition to try to ramp up here. By the time they even get into design wins, they're already shipping the next chip. So I, I think Broadcom is really misunderstood by a lot of people. And, and I think the purpose of this, by the way, this was their first financial analyst event, I think ever. Really? And, yeah, and, talk, and Hock Tan wasn't there, <laughs> okay? So he obviously talks on, on quarterly calls and he goes to you know, industry conferences, but he, 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 wasn't, he wasn't there. This was Charlie Cowes' show. Um, they have 26, I think, business units and 17 of them are silicon. They obviously have some software as well. They bought CA, they've got VMware and, and others. Um, but it was really, I think, designed to educate people on their business. And what struck me is, and we- They did a good job on it, I thought they did a absolutely. great job. Absolutely, and we learned this, Charlie laid this out at Mobile World Congress, and um, when, when he was on our show, there were three things he said. We start with the market. And we always look for markets that are durable, meaning we don't really care if they're on a 20%, 30%, 50%, 100% of year growth rate. That doesn't matter to us. What matters to us is will this market be here 10 years from now? So this is durable. And then the second thing he said, technology. We look for areas where we can be the technology leader. And then the third was execution. You know, the old saying, if you execute or be executed, well, they're really good at execution. And so what, so that's, that's great. Okay, that's their strategy. But what impressed me was every speaker that stood up 
talked about their markets, the history of their markets. They did demonstrate a deep understanding of the market and where it came from and, and where it's going. They also demonstrated technology leadership. How many times yesterday did we hear, well, we were first at this PCIe chip, we were first with this AI chip in 2014, first, 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 and then they showed their roadmaps. By the way, first, they said that first a lot, but also they said we went, we started way back here. Yeah. And me personally, be working, uh, breaking my career with IBM and H spending nine years at HP in the 80s, 90s, HP was an, the old Hewlett Packard yeah. was very instrumental in a lot of the Broadcom success, and they actually called them the grandfather yeah. of some of these chips. Right. Um, so that made me feel, and and with the combined presentation, that felt like Silicon Valley. Dude. Yeah. It felt like the like the old school Silicon Valley. We're engineering killer product, and, the, and, and the, it wasn't just like fly by night. Hey, we got some new shit. It was like we have real engineered system. We're proud. We're going to be. They weren't too loud about it. They weren't too cocky. Like I said, they were kind of humble, but they weren't. They were like, look at who's got this. Well, and, and then the third piece was their execution. And then they, again, they demonstrated. They got leadership in all these different markets. And then they took us to these, these rooms and they showed us, you know, they showed us the tech. We couldn't take pictures. They wouldn't allow us to take pictures, but it was... It was really impressive what they did, and you know we saw the custom silicon. There was, no, there was no photos allowed, just for you guys watching. There's no photos allowed. We would have had photos. Um, the only photos they had was some stage PR stuff, but that we weren't involved in that. We were too busy getting the demos. Um, they had a breakout after the presentations, three, five rooms. We got we were we spent all of our time in room five. That was in the custom silicon room. This guy Frank um, Ost Ostrich, he was awesome. I loved his speech. I see Jazz, I think, has got the killer strategic piece with Interconnect. So I think Jazz Trembley and Frank, Jazz and Frank on the team, had the two kind of killer products. These Interconnects and how they're engineering the, the inside the, the chip is key, but the custom silicon was great. Room 5 was all about custom silicon, and what they're doing is amazing. Uh, and, their, and their custom product packaging with Optical, the CPO product, Dave, they have, the, they have this yeah. thing called a CPO. A CPO is custom package optics, okay, where they embed the optical components into the chip. So all you need is two connectors and you're done. And in the old ways, you had to put multiple connectors in there for uh, these transceivers, the optical transceivers, and they're prone to error. Um, you got human error, you got you know, cable error, connector error, but embedding the custom package, again, this is going to show the advantage of, of uh, Broadcom is it's going to be a silicon war of who's going to have the best product. And again, they did great. The other thing you saw was a real emphasis on getting as much out of copper as possible because it's, it's, it's lower cost, it's more reliable, um, and it's you know, less complex. And so they basically there's a sort of optics avoidance. I mean, you need optics, yeah. right, to go distance, but but there's uh, the optics avoidance at all cost, <laughs> and then maybe not at all cost, but but use the t process and your technology, and then only go to optics when you really have to and bring in that complexity. The other thing that they really did a good job of is explaining. Look, uh, one of the speakers uh, used the analogy of surfing waves. He said, "I'm a surfer." I can, I, me and my daughter, we can surf the <laughs> one foot, the two foot waves, no problem. You start getting to those five foot, six foot waves, it starts to get hairy, you know, maybe you can try that. Those 15 foot waves, whoa, you don't want to do that because you're going to get hurt. And basically- He also used a skiing analogy. He used a skiing, right. And, but, it, which is maybe resonates better with people, but he basically said, we're really good at surfing the 15 foot waves. <laughs> like the scary <laughs> stuff yeah. we do and we yeah. do it really yeah. well. And to your point, you know, they weren't really bragging about it, but just like, hey, who else can do this? They, 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 did, they did a good job of bragging without bragging. I mean, it's, yeah. first of all, it's not bragging when it's true, it is, right? Yeah, so right. so they, they, they laid it out. The other analogy he did with skiing was, if you're going to do black diamonds, you want to make sure you have your-, your Black your diamonds with skeletons. Up. That's <laughs> what we were really good at, that, those <laughs> pump runs. <laughs> you know? the, the shoots and kind the- Kind of like you and I at yeah, uh, yeah. Deer, Deer Valley that time. The <laughs> old days, yeah. I mean, I, I can do one black diamond run now. I'm kind of retired to blue squares. But, um, you know, I wrote on, on LinkedIn um, uh, on my summary of the event, and I just I just think this these XPU, they call it XPU, because it's CPU, GPU, TPU, what is a MPU, lot of new, there's right. new, new MPUs, all kinds of, processing units coming out. And they don't care. They're like, whatever you want to use. Well, I think, we'll I think the genius of their strategy is not to compete with the processors. 
And what the, the way they built their architecture, it's like Lego blocks to just plug the processor in, mo very modular in the design. And again, shorting down the design cycles will enable potentially Broadcom to build chips for the masses. And, and as custom workloads become more prevalent in the enterprise, and I think that's going to be interesting to watch as, because we know for example, I mean, first of all, Broadcom came out and said, it's important to say Broadcom came out for this event and said, we're talking about consumer AI, not enterprise AI. Um, and, and I think their main reasoning is all the money right now is in consumer AI because those companies like Facebook, TikTok, or Fight Dance, which is TikTok, uh, um, and the Amazons of the world, the hyperscales that are serving applications that, that have large scale. And they consumer. sell to Apple, as we know. So those are that's where the action is. But okay, fast forward, consumer always is a, is a, is a predictor of enterprise. If enterprise have the ability to do custom workloads, for distributed computing, public cloud, premise, edge, you're going to see workloads that are highly specialized in the enterprise that are going to potentially have the opportunity to have a custom chip. Why wouldn't you? It's like having a server that's dedicated for a workload that a customer knows is running on their business. So I think you're going to see um, workloads on the enterprise that will be that will be candidates for custom silicon. Well. And that's going to be the new thing it, it, it that bring, will emerge. It brings up an interesting point: is at what, at what, what are the design, what are the decision points at which Broadcom and its and its partners decide to go down the custom route? And Charlie Cowis, I thought, did a good job of explaining this. He said, "Look, if you take Merchant Silicon and you apply it, you know, it's great, but it doesn't give you that differentiation. But these big internet companies, they have very specific workloads, and if you can build custom chips." specifically purpose-built and designed for those workloads, you can save a ton of money, you can save a ton of power. He was talking about you know, Meta and Google. I mean, these are huge hyperscalers that you know, if you can save 80 watts you know, across millions and millions of chips, you know, you're saving a lot of money. And of course, this is a huge problem for data center you know, operators. And so that's where they decide to do it. That plus the volume, obviously, and of course, can they make money at it? So that was really interesting. And then the other piece is they talked about software that they've developed, that they're engineers. They are an engineering company. I mean, yeah. very clear. It's engineers everywhere. You know, there's not a lot of sales and marketing there. <laughs> so it's like hardcore engineers. But they've developed software as part of their workflow so that they can get the tape out. He gave two examples. I think one was seven months and one was nine months that were able to get the tape out. And then they showed, to your point, this packaging about the size, you know, of this, this, this laptop. And they just pop in XPUs. The customer can put in XPUs. They can put in high bandwidth memory. They can configure it any way they want. And Broadcom's IP is the connectivity between all this. And they showed, one of the most powerful slides they showed is they put it up there. They said, mm -hmm. okay, we're the red, right, <laughs> on the slide. All these mm -hmm. different components, we're the red. All this hard stuff that nobody wants to do. Mm -hmm. And then they, they, they weren't the XPUs. Now that's, that's Intel, that's NVIDIA. That's you know Qualcomm, whomever, but that's not us. We don't do that. We do everything in between, and and it's really lucrative. And you just look at their numbers. I mean, they're they're highly profitable company. So um, I got a note from VJ after we left because we um, we had we were in room five. Um, Charlie Quas had a surprise for the people who hung around. They demo they demonstrated um, the. CPO, the, the custom package optics, which is an optical interconnect for AI systems, where they had um, one s CPU switch, a custom processor with optical, that replaces 128 400 gig optical modules. Okay, let's put that in perspective. <laughs> a chip about this big, okay, fully contained with optics interconnects. So it's an AI chip with all the optics in there replaces 128 400 gig optical modules. Wow. So talk about all right. So talk about instant ROI. This is why chips are getting bigger, not smaller, because you have a lot of benefits inside chip architecture that Broadcom laid out, and video is kind of encapsulating in their in their model as well as a monolith, is that you can do a lot more in the chip if you engineer it this way, and that's essentially going to lower the energy envelope, right? The power envelope. So you get power and cooling are the new constraints. And again, AI systems, we've been saying this on the queue for over a year now, Dave, there will be a new infrastructure for AI. It has to be. 
and it's not what the old one was. So you're starting to see a glimpse. That's why I think the NVIDIA event and the Broadcom financial analyst was well-timed because you have the curtain being lifted on the requirements for the new infrastructure. When that bit gets flipped, pun intended, you're going to see software snap in line. So you're going to see a huge renaissance and a Cambrian explosion of software development. Okay, because Amazon has already kind of laid it out with, with cloud. NVIDIA with CUDA shows that you can run great software stack on top of existing hardware. And then as this a, these AI clusters and systems and chips come out, the AI chips, AI clusters will enable a new AI software model. And I think that's going to be a very, very fun computer science um, boom. Well, in AI. and today, again, we go back to the picks and shovels. So who are the picks and shovels? Obviously, NVIDIA, you know, clearly Broadcom, you know, some of their customers, you know, we see Dell and, and, and Supermicro and HP selling systems, S uh, Synopsys, Cadence, right? The companies like that who do the, the, the design software. Um, but that's all sort of infrastructure, right? And then, to your point, the next wave is software. So all SaaS is going to be injected with AI. So you're going to see intelligent apps right, emerging. So ServiceNow, Snowflake, Databricks, Adobe, Workday, you know, on and on and on. Oracle, their apps are going to get more intelligent. So they're going to add more value. But the, but the other piece, John, is the 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 end customers of those products, right? The industrial manufacturers, the healthcare companies, the pharmaceutical companies, the automotive companies, they're all going to be using AI and they're going to create, they're probably collectively going to create way more wealth than the computer industry suppliers. And so that is when the rising tide lifts all ships. But I will say this, right now the macro's softening we talked last week about how it's backloaded, and that was preliminary data. I've talked to ETR, and they're like, mm, it's looking like this is not, it's still preliminary, but it's looking like pretty solid. So the, the, the IT spending is going to basically go from an expected, this is across 1,700 IT decision makers, from 4.3% down to maybe 3.5%. So it's softening. It's being even more backloaded. Q1 and Q2 look a little bit softer, and AI continues to steal from other budget buckets. So the reason I bring this up is because we've got to start seeing ROI. Customers, two-thirds of customers say that they want to see ROI within 12 months. Now, I don't think that's across the board right now. I think there's, the ROI is still pretty elusive. The other thing is 44% of customers tell us that they're, they're stealing from other budgets to fund their AI. Okay, so there's still a lot of proof points going on, and Charlie Kawas made this uh, point yesterday when he was talking about the clear business case in consumer. It's not as clear in enterprise. People keep talking about, what are the use cases? Well, you know, helping us write code, summarize documents, write marketing documents, all good, all wonderful. Mm -hmm. But the real killer use cases that are going to throw off cash and allow gain sharing really have not emerged yet. And I think you know your point about that is interesting. If you look at um, on social media, Michael Dell just shared something where Jensen was at the booth and someone caught a camera. If you want to buy from IT, buy from Dell. So he's like out there. And and if you look at uh, he was what I love about Jensen is on the floor going to all the booths getting photo ops and. Obviously, it's his show. It's, it's, it's like a rock star. It's, it, it's, it's, good, it's good marketing. I mean, there are hundreds of people following him. He went to that. every booth. I mean, I, I think that is just a genuine, cool thing to do, and, and props to him for doing it. He's just a cool guy. Why wouldn't you go to He booth? spent a lot of time on the show. Floor. I mean, if you're a, coming to my show, I'd love to go to your booth and, and give you an acknowledgement and, you know, and give you a thumbs up and give you a shout out, right? Why wouldn't you? It's good, it's good politics, uh, and it's good to do the rah-rah because they'll come back and get a booth next year. But <laughs> you mentioned Dell. Dell announced this idea of an AI factory. Yep. Dell AI factory, they call it. Yep. Dell AI factory, yep. not NVIDIA AI factory. Smart marketing. So, so if you look at Dell, and Dell has been a supplier of PCs and servers, okay, and so that's their core competency. I think, like I've been saying, this is a refactoring of the computer industry. You're seeing the AI systems being refactored not as servers, but as clusters. So what Dell is doing is they're refactoring their value proposition of a server and PC to be AI, which means that their customers will be deploying AI factories. Now, 
if Dell can provide that server resource as a service, does it matter? It's still a product and service from Dell. I mean, the servers, remember the first servers were Pentium based, remember? I and do. then like they got better and better and better and then blades and then scale. And so this is just another evolution of servers. So if you're Dell, of course you want to be on the AI factory. You don't have a cloud, okay? You're not Amazon, okay? Remember everyone tried to be Amazon for a few years? Yeah, I mean, John, D Dell, Dell is remarkable to me. I mean, Michael Dell is like Midas. You think about what he's done. You think about that, I mean, the, the, the risk he took with VMware, if I may for a second, he t the timing of that was just unbelievable. And you can say it was lucky, maybe it was, but he's, his instincts were amazing. He was able to raise money when interest rates were so low. He was able to recapitalize his companies when interest rates were so low. He was able to take his private company public during a time when interest rates were so low. And he just leveraged that, like his timing was unbelievable. Now you know, I mean, I've always said Dell is a low margin company. I'd like to see them get more into software. I was a big fan, it was never gonna happen, but I would have loved to see them spin in VMware and become the oracle of infrastructure, kind of like Broadcom's doing now, <laughs> right? Consolidating down and really getting focused. I think that would have been like an unbelievable strategic move by Dell and it would have like propped up their margins, but of course, they just had the opportunity to make such, you know, have such wealth creation. But we had IBM on, on the cube. But, but, so, okay, but, but so hold on. So, so, okay, so that's cool. I have been saying for years that Dell, despite the fact that they are a low margin company, that's it's absurd that they were trading at like 33 cents on the revenue dollar. And I've always said they should be at least one X. And frankly, I think they should be higher than that in terms of just a simple revenue multiple. Well, because of their supply chain, and because of their dividend, they've thrown off so much cash that they're returning to shareholders. And because now the AI wave, Dell is basically very close to trading at 1x revenue, which is I've always felt like they should at least be there. Now with this AI wave and this Dell AI factory, and you see the momentum when you go to their booth, you saw it at MWC, which is a longer term play for them. And that's the payback's gonna take a while longer. But the, the AI play is real and it's now. And, and you saw that at their booth. You, you can just feel the, the momentum there. And the street loves this stock. It's, it's like cranking. And like I said, Michael Dell, it's just a, it's remarkable. His timing and his Midas touch. Who wins with NVIDIA? Uh, Dell's a great example. I think HPE can win yeah. with NVIDIA. IBM can be a great winner. I mean, if you look at IBM, the way they're poised, they came on the queue. Talk about that. Um, and they have all the uh, answers there. They have uh, Watson X, which is essentially a reboot of Watson. I mean, IBM, what better time to recycle I Watson right now? Because you can actually take all that work they've done and leverage some of the modern AI techniques with, with generative AI and bring the benefits of the old Watson and with the new Watson, hence Watson X. You got Watson X, you got a beautiful storage server portfolio, okay? You have the same workstations. You got the professional services. Um, and so IBM could really be the AI factory um, company for the enterprise. And I think, you know, um, Dell and IBM are just world-class companies uh, and HPE are world-class suppliers of IT solutions over decades with great built-in channels of distribution, partner networks, ecosystems, all of them have ecosystems. So I look at those three on the track right there and I go, wow, those guys could transform themselves they missed the hyperscale, I want to be AWS. They all tried, okay? Uh, VMware is now part of Broadcom, so it's a separate animal. We won't, we'll, we'll talk about that differently because that software business has Oracle, a huge opportunity. Oracle kind of did it in their niche, but yeah. Well, I think I, Oracle's, I Oracle's kind of like more above, not just being a supplier, but they're more cloud. They have a cloud opportunity. That's what I'm saying. They're, they're OCI yeah. stuff. When you're you're comment about AWS, as I was just responding. Oh yeah, yeah, so yeah. you have those, they're the fourth cloud, whatever yeah. you want to call them, fifth cloud. But there I would call them an opportunity, but they still are a supplier to IT with the database and all other things. But those other companies that missed the cloud wave to build hyperscale cloud when they backed off was a smart move because they couldn't win. Now could get into the game with a DGX-like approach. And so NVIDIA being such a great system they essentially could be the ingredient of the AI factory, meaning now they can enable their partners, Dell, HPE, and IBM, and others to be the AI factory supplier. And companies like Vast, DDN, uh, Weka, Storage, 
specialized storage, great object store, great scale. Those guys become Head key components, scale, yeah. key subsystem components in the AI factory. And again, you look at all the other players, NetApp, Pure, they could miss it, right? So I'm watching those two companies specifically right now and I'm questioning myself, NetApp and Pure in particular, are they positioned for the AI? Now it's Pure stocks up, so that's an in indicator, but are their products set up for AI? That's a question, we'll have to ask those guys. So that's a follow-up I want to get with Pure um, and, and NetApp. Um, I think they will survive, and again, they, are they an ingredient to the AI factory, or are they an integral part of a subsystem? And that's going to be the question, uh, these AI factories, and, and we'll unpack that in other pods for sure. I, I want to come back to IBM. IBM is back. There's, there's no question in my mind that what Arvin has done is he's really focused the company back to, I, I think, some of its original roots, which are pr product and innovation for so many years under, you know, Gerstner made the decision that we're you know, not going to split the company in two. And basically they, they bought PwC and, and it became a situation where the services, the consulting services were the tail wagging the IBM dog. And they, for, under, under Palmasano and, and Ginny, they were really services led, in my opinion. And what Arvind has done is, and, and by, by the way, during that time, it was almost as though the complexity was a friend of IBM because they had really great services capabilities like Accenture and they had product and so they could put them together and that was their strategy to make money, but it didn't, it didn't work well from you know, the, the standpoint of IBM's you know, position in the industry. What Arvind has done is he's really focused the company on hybrid cloud, on AI, leveraging consulting, you know, very effectively. But what he's done is during those years where services led, the, the, the R&D that IBM did, which is an American gem, IBM research, never turned into product. And this was always one of my big criticism about IBM, but they are very clearly focused on that. Dario Gill, who runs IBM research, and Rob Thomas, who we know well, um, who's got you know software chops? He's got M and A chops, and he's you know got go to market chops. They're very very focused on investments that are made in R and D and IBM research, getting to market in the form of leading products. When was the last time IBM had a leading product that you could say that they're number one at? Yeah, they're sure they're up in the magic quadrants and so forth, but they have an opportunity to really be an AI leader. They learned a lot with Watson Original. The OG Watson, they made a lot of mistakes. They tried to put it in places where it didn't belong. But now they have like really legit deep AI learnings and AI capabilities across the board from analytics to governance to language models to silicon. And you know, we'll see what happens with quantum. Jensen made some interesting comments about quantum. But Irrespective of that, IBM, in my opinion, is really back and has just strong days ahead. Well, one of the things we're going to chronicleize certainly is the winners and losers of the AI factory model coming, the AI chip, the AI infrastructure, the AI software stack. Um, it's interesting how um, NVIDIA's using the word super, super pods. So um, super cloud's got traction. I'll see that sticking, super chips. Yeah, what was another word we heard? Uh, super um, switch. Um, switch. Um, so, you're starting to see this multi-cloud, but it's, it's a, the thing that Broadcom came out, and this is why I like Broadcom so much right now uh, on, on, the, on the semi side, because it's converging. And I think VMware is going to have to catch up to Broadcom a, a little bit on this, because um, their AI is, I think, a little bit more private AI, a little bit it's stalling, st uh, holding pattern, in my opinion. Broadcom gets that the biggest problem that's going to face the industry, the biggest opportunity, will be to solve the infrastructure from the chip to the app for what I call the distributed computing problem set. The distributed computing problem set is this. In distributed computing, well-known computer science theory, of which they're very familiar with, if you're in computer science or been an engineer, distributed computing is a multi-decade computer science problem. AI has to run on a distributed computing architecture. And the, what's being done is a refactoring of the chips and systems to support the most robust, scalable, highest performance distributed computing platform that's 
global and open. It's not one mainframe. It's not a company. It's everything it has to run distributedly. And that's going to be an amazing uh, opportunity. And it's going to be new. It's going to be something that's going to be magical. So you'll see distributed computing become the fabric of life. That means everything will have to be re-engineered for distributed computing. And I think that's what I heard from Broadcom. If you, if you, if you connect the dots at the Broadcom meeting and NVIDIA and the work we've been doing with clustered systems and the research on Cube Research is that everything's revolving around distributed computing problem and the opportunity that it yields. Private cloud, public cloud, distributed edge, mobile cars, robots, AI, intelligence, data access, all has to be refactored for distributed computing. The chips are coming out first, and then the architecture for the clusters, and then the abstraction layer for software enablement, then the invention creativity happens, and then that's where generative AI, I think, hits. And I think it's where Jensen nailed it by saying, generative AI is a new category. Life before generating AI was pre-recorded. Everything in life was pre-recorded, how we get our news, how we get our opinions, everything was set up for us, databases, query or response, pre-recorded, get an answer. So I think generative is a more robust environment. So the distributed computing paradigm is going to be not a one company thing, but an industry thing. And I think the servers move to clusters, clusters move to systems, global systems, and everything kind of goes on from there. So I think that is the exciting moment we're in. Uh, one other thing I wanted to mention before we break is, um, is Reddit. Reddit IPO today, I think they're going out $34 and they're saying it's going to open about 30% or 35% above. What was their valuation before they went public? I don't know, but I think they're like a five or six billion dollar valuation is what, what they'll end up at. They priced um, their IPO at 34 bucks a share. There you go. Okay, 5.9 million they raised, five, 519 million they raised. Um, at nearly 6.5 billion ahead of the market debut, that was the headline. So, and they're allocating, I think, seven or eight percent of the shares to their to, for retail for their Reddit army, which is kind of interesting because you go on Reddit and they're like, "That ah, is a shit stock." <laughs> that's like <laughs> it's their own people right, are trashing them, but that's what Reddit's all about. It's Reddit's amazing. I I, I love Reddit. Um, Reddit's everywhere, right? Reddit has something for everybody. You got marital problems, go to Reddit. You got, you got you're looking for a job, go to Reddit. You're looking for advice on hair, go to Reddit. I mean, it's just amazing. And, um, and you know, they're small in the grand scheme of things, but they're not, they're not extracting your data and monetizing it. That's what I really like about Reddit. I think, I think they're, you know, that their model could, hopefully this sets off a little IPO action, John. We could, <laughs> we could see Databricks potentially, you could see Arctic Wolf maybe, you know, going. Will the window be open? A couple of companies that we've been following. Yeah. Um, and then the other, the other news this week was Intel secured an $8.5 billion, you know, grant from the government, from the CHIPS Act, and they got, I think, another 11 billion in secured loans. So it was like 20 billion. So Intel got so a bailout. Uh, Is that a bailout? Yeah, Intel's getting a bailout. I mean, I think that's the, it, the Pat Gelsinger thanked everybody except the U.S. taxpayer, and and you know I understand why because it's you know that's <laughs> that's sort of controversial to say that, but it's true. The U.S. taxpayer is bailing out Intel and you know covering for its mistakes in the past ten years, and so yeah, um, but I I'm for it. You know I'm I'm, I'm happy to to take my little piece of the tax money and and put it there. Um, I think the question is, John. Well, the is, question is that is they can they win? Well, that's, Intel, the, big, that's can, the big question. Can Intel win? Their goal is to be number two in foundry um, by 2030, and and the whole concept here, and you listen to the Commerce Secretary and, and and President Biden and others, is to bring manufacturing back to the U.S. And I think that's a long, that's a tall order. So if if your objective is to to do that for national security reasons and you know supply chain, you know control. You could make an argument, John, irrespective of the fact that Intel is a U.S.-based company, and I would much rather see U.S.-based companies get my money. You could make an argument that you'd be better off, you'd be a higher probability of success giving that money to TSM and Samsung because they're way ahead of Intel. And so, but that again is controversial, right? Okay, we have a lot of government inter interactions going on here. You got Intel getting fed money by the government. Some say they don't deserve it. I'm thinking, I'm questioning, is that good use of taxpayer money? My opinion is, can they even win? And will there, is the way they design and, ch and ship chips, 
Um, is that going to work when you see what Broadcom's doing, how fast they're going? I'm just like thinking maybe that's time for Intel to, to rethink that. Who knows? We got to get They're more going data. for it. We got to get you more know? data. And bid 20 um, billion, by the way. We'll get them two thirds so, of the so, factory. You know, the government making decisions on who the winners will be <laughs> by giving money, subsidizing Intel. Uh, it's a subsidy. It's a, it's a bailout, whatever you want to call it. It's money from the government. Now the government's involved and they decided who made that decision, whatever. Good job for Pat. Get the cash. The other issue going on now is Apple um, got sued by the DOJ yeah. for um, uh, alleging it's a monopoly and blocking competitors from accessing iPhone features. Um, so Lena Khan's like 0 for 5 on that front. This is we'll DOJ. What happens this. This is Department of Justice. Yeah, so okay. okay. This is not Lena Khan. Well, is, that's this is that, bigger. That, that'll have more teeth then. This, this'll, this, they, they, the department said that they leverage dominance to block software and limit functionality. You know what I think they do, devices. John. I think actually Apple does. I think that I'm actually kind of in favor for the DOJ getting Apple in a little bit of a headlock and saying, come on. Well, does, do we want the government to basically be, have their hand in designing uh, technology? He, Apple's products are great. So what, get the hell out of the country. You know how I feel about this is, is that the markets, market forces have always been much more successful in moderating monopolies than the government. Having said that, if, if a company is breaking the law and violating um, you know, monopoly rule, antitrust rules, they should be investigated. Now, the problem with Lena Khan is she is rewriting, trying to rewrite those laws. But if the DOJ is, is determining that Apple has... Has, has, has violated that law, then they should investigate. I'm all for that, but let's not drag it out for 10, 12 years like they did with Microsoft and IBM. It's just you know, a waste I mean, of money and a waste of time. I mean, I, I see what Apple's doing from a competitive strategy standpoint. I just don't, I mean, I, they have monopolistic scale. Um, first of all, I, I would say the same thing about Amazon, AWS, Google, and others. When you have that kind of scale, you got leverage. Um, but at the end of the day, there's a lot of bad, other bad stuff going on. It's, they live in a highly competitive market. I mean, it's not like Apple sitting there going, we're wrong. I mean, they're making a boatload of bank on how they make money, and they deserve it because they made a great product, and they have a good well, model. Well, I think it's, it's that so app it's store. It's not like right? it's not competitive. There's think, plenty of choice. But it's the app store, right? Is it's the, the app store and the iPhone. It's like, so they had I mean, the Epic. iPhone, you can get an iPhone, you can get a smartphone from Samsung. They make great smartphones. Yeah, you can, you can switch plans, use Android. So it's not like it's not a competitive market. So, you know, one thing Apple does really well, and we take it for granted, is they have privacy protection. I mean, I love Apple's um, biometric stuff. Their facial recognition for getting into passwords. Sometimes it's almost too good. I forget my password. It's like... Like I'm on another machine. I'm like, oh shit, what's my password? Yeah, I can't remember it. So many. Apple I'm using passwords. I'm using the finger on the bio on my Mac. I got the face. <laughs> I've been an Apple face login so on the. Uh, I the love iPhone. Apple too. I love Apple. I mean, too. come on, it's, it's but, just, but, just but, a superior product on security. Now, okay, I can't choose Epic Games feature or whatever. Okay, I just don't. I, I just think it's a little bit over the top. I get nervous. Oh, I get nervous. I gotta go when government is getting involved. <laughs> All right, well, that's a wrap. Dave's got to catch his plane. <laughs> Uber's here. All right, Dave, good, have a good trip back to Boston. Great week. Um, and shout out to the folks in Paris uh, for KubeCon, Rob Stretch, Savannah Peterson, Dustin Kirkland, and our community. Uh, wish I could have been there this year. Um, I'll see you in North America. I love that show. One of my favorite shows is, is what CNC has. I think Cloud Native is going to KubeCon. It's going to morph into Cloud Native Con. Open source is booming. Open source AI models are booming. Um, cloud AI, AI systems, AI factories. Episode 52 is going to be insane. I can't wait for the next next week. Dave, good to see Thanks, you. Thanks, John. Thanks for watching. Thanks, guys.